It's that time again when we go around the world of business in 55 minutes. This is Business Incorporated, and here's what we have for you on the program today. President Ruto refused risks of debt default in Kenya. In a season of forecast and outlook, IMF downgrades South Africa growth forecast for 2024. And you can be a citizen of Zimbabwe. All you have to do is to cost you $5,000. Welcome to the program. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Let's uh, start off, as usual, with the global space. And then, of course, we delve down to the continent. Started with oil prices. It fell on Wednesday as lackluster economic activity in China, which is the world's biggest crude importer, weighed on sentiment. But prices were set for their first monthly gain since September as broadening Middle East conflict raised supply concerns. Brent crude features for March, which expires today, was down 31 cents. That's about 0.4 percent to $82.56 a barrel, while the more actively traded April contract fell 29 cents to $82.21 a barrel. U.S. West Texas Intermediate crude features declined 25 cents. That's about 0.3 percent to $77.57 a barrel. Manufacturing activity in China, the world's second largest economy and oil consumer, contracted for a fourth straight month in January, according to official factory survey, and suggesting that economic momentum was flagging at the start of 2024. Forecasts from several analysts, including from the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries, that's OPEC, says oil demand growth in 2024, driven primarily by Chinese consumption and signs of a slowing economy there undercut those outlooks. Both Brent and WTI are set to rise over 7% in one month in January alone. Chicago wheat features fell on Wednesday and is headed for their first monthly decline since September as falling Russian export prices and a threatening dollar weighed on U.S. prices. Soybean and corn features also dipped and were set for monthly falls after rain boosted prospects for crops in Brazil and Argentina at a time when markets are well supplied. The most active wheat contract on the Chicago Board of Trade was down 0.5% at $6.02 for three quarter of a bushel, but down around 4% this month, and not far from last September's three-year low of $5.40. The market has been awash with cheap wheat from Russia, where export prices fell again last week. Prices of wheat, soybeans and corn rallied on Tuesday, but traders said this was bargain buying, not backed by news about supply or demand. In other crops now, CBOT soybean fell 0.5% to $12.13 for a quarter of a bushel, and we're down around 6.5% in January, Corn slipped 0.2% to $4.47 a bushel, was around 5% lower over the month. Soybeans hit a two-year low of 11.5 on Tuesday, and corn has hit a three-year low of $4.37 twice this month. And then we come to Nigeria. Yesterday we did talk about that uh, President Bola Tinubu uh, may have directed that revenue from crude sale be transferred directly to Central Bank of Nigeria instead of it being kept at the NNPCL. Well, we got a reaction this time yesterday when we were talking about this. We had no confirmation or refute on that story. Now, the Chief Corporate Communications Officer of NNPCL, Mr. Alufe Mishunaye, said that, um, and I quote him uh, in the message that he shared, at this time, I am not aware of any of such directive. Uh, should there be any updates of further information on this matter, I will promptly notify you. That's the Chief Corporate Communication Officer of the NNPCL saying that. And I have to say that there's al already been uh, a lot of reactions to this, uh, this seemingly directive, uh, which the NNPCL said they've not gotten this morning. If you watch our sister program, Sunrise Daily, uh, mails there uh, show that people are happy 
if that directive is true, because they believe it will bring more transparency in managing crude revenue in the country, which of course has been in the news for a bit now. Now to Forex, the value of Naira has been in the news consecutively every day, hitting new lows yesterday. We saw a change and it seems there's been amendments to the methodologies applied for the computation of the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange fixing, that's NAFEX, and the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange market, that's NAFEM, our spot closing rates are referred to as FX rates pricing methodologies. The previous, uh, this change aims to address recent fluctuations and challenges encountered in the Nigerian foreign exchange. The revisions are focused on enhancing the accuracy and reliability of both NAFEX and NAFEM rates uh, determination process with a focus to, on data availability and integrity involving a rigorous data validation process including tolerance checks, which shall be applied by FMDQ exchange and subject to internal policies and procedures. These measures aim to ensure that NAFEX and NAFEM rate accurately reflect market condition while upholding price formation and transparency. And that's why we've seen uh, at the close of trade yesterday, uh, there was a, well, a smaller gap between the parallel market and the official market. In fact, we had the official market uh, with a lower rate for the Naira. Now, also yesterday, we had that uh, news from the Central Bank of Nigeria where it announced the settlement of all verified Forex claims by foreign airlines. We need to take note of that, all verified foreign uh, Forex claims by foreign airlines operating in the country with an additional payment of $64.44 million. That's what they paid yesterday, bringing total disbursement to foreign airlines to $136.73 million. Uh, that's from the Central Bank. Well, this development, according to the Central Bank, underlines the bank's commitment to resolving outstanding FX obligations across all sectors. Meanwhile, there's been reaction to that. The statement by the International Air Transport Association, IETA, says that it welcomes the central bank's announcement and stresses that while the release of an additional $64.44 million is encouraging, it's still a long way to addressing the full issue as about $700 million is still blocked in the country's commercial banks. Well, let's delve into this now. Um, of course, we've got, as expected, a lot of reactions to this. Let's get the reality straight from someone who is directly involved with that, the president of National Association of Nigerian Travel Agencies, that's Nanta. We had Mrs. Susan Akwareye joins us virtually from Abuja. Good afternoon, ma'am. Good afternoon, compliments of the season. Good to see you again. Yeah, good to see you. Wish you the same. So, um, <clears throat> Uh, I mean, is this a disparity or is it just because I noticed that the central bank did put that phrase um, verified claims, you know, when they were giving out this and they said they have taken care of all verified claims. And now Ayata is saying, well, it's still remaining about $700 million. Does that mean this $700 million is not part of the verified claims or is there a miscalculation somewhere? I know you've been meeting with Ayata a lot. Um, yes, it's actually two different things, and um, CBN is correct. And this claims, uh, I'll, I'll dive into a little about the history briefly. You know, before this new government took over, we've had this issue of block funds. It was 814 million at some time, and they released 250 thereabout. It brought it down and on and on and on, and this administration inherited some amount, and they have been paying. Now, when this administration came in, they, they made it clear to the airline, there's, there, there's a shortage of this Forex challenge. Hence the reason why there was dragging of um, um, matured uh, bids. Like you said, verified claims. Most of those money has matured. They have won the bid. The, the, the maturity date has elapsed like over a year. But because there was no funds to pay them. So there was an agreement. I mean, the government through CB and told them, look, there is, there's a situation here. We don't have enough forex. So from when the new administration came in, the airlines were told to source for their funds that they would not be 
held liable, held liable for giving them money as they used to do. So they should source for their funds ongoing at the IIE window. So they will not expect CBN to give them any money anymore. But they are committed to making sure the outstanding from the previous government is totally cleared. And that is what they have done. I know this outstanding, they has to go through some verification. So I want to believe there were some of them that didn't pass through verification. So that was now set aside in which the parties involved will have to go to CBN and find a way of clearing that. That's why I said verified claims has been paid. It is the backlog which this administration committed to the airlines that they were going to pay. And the administration made it clear that they cannot continue with this method and told the airlines to source for their fundings in the open market, the IAE window. So from all the ticket sales from that period in the IAE window, it is the 700 million that Ayata was talking about. So both of them, in a way, they're right. CBN is right. They have cleared the part they promised they were going to clear. Now, there's a situation with the IAE window. The airlines are not getting. That's why, if you notice, Ayata said commercial bans. They were no longer saying the government this time around because the government is not the one uh, in charge of that. It's, it has been made an open market. Hence, the reason why we experience the rate of exchange that we use to sell tickets going, increasing, increasing. Today is 1,515. I mean, so it's even higher than black markets. So that is the 700 million that Ayata is talking about with the commercial bans. Now, we have been engaging Ayata and CBN together as a team because we promise we'll work together. We are not here to fight each other, but to support each other. So like, it's a win-win for everybody. If the airlines are happy with the travel agency, we'll be happy. So that's the next phase. If you read the Ayata publication, it was soliciting and appealing to CBN that this other 700 that is in commercial banks, that they will need the help and assistance of CBN so that the commercial banks can release these funds for them. They can allow them buy these funds and being given to them. So both of them are correct. Government is correct. No more liability on the head of the government. IATA is also correct. They still have like 700 million, but no longer in the hands of the, it's no longer the government's responsibility. It's under the IIU window, which is, which is handled by the commercial banks. Hence the reason why that statement was made by commercial banks. But we still need the assistance of CBA to get to, to, to be able to allow the commercial banks to release these funds for the airlines when they come to purchase them. Mm. So, uh, I mean, I, I think it even sounds more scary now um, because uh, commercial banks, they don't, I mean, they have a regulator. Uh, but if the CBN now says, well, we've done our part, um, airlines, you have to deal with commercial banks, you're on your own. I guess at the end of the day, it is still the consumers and, you know, associations such as yours that, that will suffer. Yes. The, the, the CBN deals with commercial banks. When they have allocation, they give to them. So the airlines, not only airlines, even other sectors, all supposed to go to this IIE window where the trade is happening and, and, and source it directly by themselves. But of course, the commercial banks also get allocation from CBN, definitely. The allocation from CBN has not stopped. And we all know the IIE window says it's, it's a market for the willing seller and the willing buyer. So it's a problem of having somebody that is willing to sell. And these sales are being done through the commercial banks. And having somebody that is, uh, 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 the airlines are willing to buy, the issue they are having is there is no willing seller. Hence the reason why the thing has accumulated again to 700. But the airlines cannot categorically say this is a CBN problem, a CBN that is holding on to the money. The money that was responsible by the government, that has been cleared. Now, IIE window is willing seller, willing buyer. So there's a problem of not having willing seller because the amount the willing seller wants to buy is not the amount that the willing buyer is ready to buy, if you understand what I mean. Yeah. So there's a stalemate in that market too as well. Mm. So the IIE window was supposed to help the situation, actually. But unfortunately, um, the, the, the human factor, like I said, I mean, we Nigerians cannot exonerate ourselves from the situation we have found ourselves. We cannot just all blame the government alone. We all have our part to play. So the IR window initially was a fantastic idea. And if it was working well, willing seller, willing buyer, that accumulation of 700 wouldn't have happened. When the IA window started, it worked very well for three months. It actually worked very well until the thing stilled. Because now, I, it, it stilled because the CBN now came and pegged 
the IAE widow the particular amount. That was when all of a sudden there was no willing seller anymore because they wanted to sell above the peg that CBN made for more profit. So immediately that peg was there, they all withdrew from selling. And we all know that is the law of the IAE, we willing seller, willing buyer. So now we're not started facing another crisis. There were people that were not willing to come to sell that dollar so the airlines couldn't buy. So that's why that is there. And that is why the second stage of our intervention now, that is why Ayata started by thanking the CBN. We were in a conference call with the CBN just last night. They promised that we were going to make payments, and they did. So the next phase of interaction with the CBN is how do we make sure the, 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 the IE window that has still made works again? What are the things that CBN can do? What policies can they bring in place to make sure the IE window works freely? Because if IE window is working freely, the airlines will be able to source for their funds and buy because they are willing to buy, but they are no willing seller. Mm. So that's the next phase of interaction with CBN, Nanta, Ayata, and CBN. For them to come in and assist, how do we do this? There's a problem. This IE window is not working. It is not working. It's gone. Oh. So what else do we do to make sure this works and we can source for our money? Yeah, I guess you already said it. Uh, if it's a willing buyer, willing seller market, then uh, maybe the, 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 the federal government have to remove that peg you know, to allow. Exactly. And then eventually exactly. we hope that the demand and supply will, you know, bring a fair price, you know, for exactly. both, for both trans yes. uh, transactions. Exactly. So that's actually what we're trying to tell the government now. All right. So just before we let you go. Um, if they remove that peg. Yeah. Yeah. So you have more willing sellers. Exactly. Okay, so you, there was a part of the interaction that you had with Ayata and CBN. Uh, one of the outcomes I see that you asked for lower inventories latest by Friday, the 2nd of February. Could you fill us in on this? Okay. Um, we've had several meetings with the airlines. We understand their plight. And we too also are also going through a lot in this situation. Wow, we do have a network glitch right there. It would be nice to know what Nanta is doing, uh, asking for lower inventories. And the deadline they gave is, is just in the next two days, Friday. Restrictions. You see, you for example, you want to go? Are you? Yes, I'm with you, Susan. Okay, okay. So we are saying that since at least we have gotten to some point, the, the governments have been kind enough to do one part of their obligation. What we are saying that the airlines should at least show some, I mean, uh, let them give us something back. Because we, 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 we threw down our sword, we were actually ready to go all out, and we were approached by Ayata and said, you know what, let's not fight. Let's work together to get a success. And we agreed. So now we felt at this point, tickets selling at 1,535 naira per dollar. Why would you not release inventory? That's what we are saying. So now they don't have any reason to withhold the lower inventories anymore and sell only the highest one. So we are saying we, we are not there yet. You have not gotten all you want yet. But there's a step in, in a good direction. Let them show us some, some goodwill. We have been patient with them. We have supported them. We have refused to come to the media to fight the airline in any way as against what our, my members wanted us to do. We actually worked together, partnered, and we have come to this stage. And we are saying, let them show us some goodwill and release inventory. Because let them release the lower ones. After all, even if they release the lower ones, first will not be as cheap as it used to be. At 1531 naira per dollar, it's not going to be cheap. But then again, it will be better than having only the highest fares. So we're saying we've helped you to this extent. Give us something back. That's what we're saying. Because the, their flights are full, but it's not being sold by us. Nigeria, somebody that wants to go to London, Lagos, London, uh, Lagos, from here, because of the fact that there are no lower events, it's very expensive. He calls an agent in, in Ghana and he issues the lower ones for them. The person did the business in Ghana, but the person is traveling from Lagos. So we have a lot of such transactions like that. That's why the aircraft of the airlines are full, but we are not selling. Our business is dying. We're suffering. And we're telling them, you know what? We've understood with you. Also understand with us and show us some good faith and release the inventory so that we can continue to support you. 
Mm. That's just what that is all about, yes. All right, and it's just on Friday, so we do hope more conversations, fruitful conversations, will take place and uh, we'll have those. I mean, it's also good for the consumers. It's, it's, it's a lot exactly. of stress we're also. actually fighting for the consumers <laughs> and ourselves too as exactly. well. Exactly. <laughs> People cry when they have to buy tickets to yes, travel. Yes, they're so expensive these days. It's, it's, yes, it's so expensive, yes. Yeah. All right, thank you so much and we wish you the best in your continuous conversation uh, with both IETA, uh, now the commercial banks and uh, the airlines. Thank you so much, President, National Association of Nigerian Travel Agencies, uh, Mrs. Susan Akore. Thank you for your time and have a great day. Thank you very much. Enjoy the rest of your day. You too. watching business incorporated right here on channels television from uh, well a slight pullback yesterday i think the market is back on the bounce uh, as of intraday today talking about the ngx but anite has the details anite yes yeah good afternoon Ine. i was just taking a look at um, my my information paper oh, I thought here it was your crystal ball uh, well I, i've left the crystal ball so ah, this is okay. more like my my mobile crystal ball but in paper form ah. so uh but i yeah you talked about the market it is uh, back in the green we, we you know we talked about the market whether you know it's um falling into the red and that's coming I think After it was a relief days. to see that pull back it was a yeah, relief yeah, because kind of, it's kind very of. unnatural to see your market just you know, gain and gain mm. and gain mm. and gain. Then you begin to suspect, is, are there some artificial hands moving mm. the market in one direction or the mm. other? Well, you know, you're, you're, you might not be wrong for, for, you know, for saying that because you also might not be the only one, you know, having that, um, that, 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 uh, perception. That, 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 that perception. Because um, I, I spoke with one of my colleagues and he was like, I'm very suspicious about this market. Why is it just <laughs> going up and up and up? Because every market around the world, around the U.S., China, uh, and Europe, uh, you know, they always have this response to certain results, certain reports, uh, economic uh, data. Certain and, rumors, know, certain rumors, news. Rumors, exactly. So, uh, and they always have that reaction. But then this market didn't react to nothing. <laughs> you, know, it, it, you know, it would draw some questions. But of course, we saw that... Um, first pullback in 20 days, but I'll be giving you details about the intraday market results. Now, uh, for the African markets, the regional markets, the four regional markets that we cover, the major ones that we cover for the, uh, for the African continent, first, starting from on the home front, we were up by more than 1% at intraday, and we're back at the 100,000 level, which we lost, or which the market lost at the close of uh, Tuesday's trading session, where we saw at intraday, you know, we, we'd gotten, we went down from, from that 104,000 level, but here we are back again, and for the talk about Tuesday, the markets had pulled back by about 1.49%, uh, no thanks to sell pressure on 61 stocks against gains from seven stocks. And then so far, the markets, um, the, uh, as at yesterday, Tuesday, the market, um, the year to date was, well, still comfortable at about 37.90%. But if we take a look at this, that means that we're back at about above that 38,000 points. So that's all for that uh, market. Now, still talking about the African market, South Africa, it had a pullback um, for intraday uh, of about 0.70%. That, that means that uh, there's still some uh, fluctuations in between bargain hunting and sell pressure on that market. Let's move to the other side of the African markets where we see Egyptian stock exchange. It was a mixed trading so far for African markets. So for the Egyptian stock exchange, for where the EGX30, it's uh, down by 0.72%. And then for Tuesday, uh, the Kenya stock exchange, it was in the green 1.79%. Now, we will be talking about 
fixed income, and then, of course, still about the Naira, which has um, uh, had uh, about a 31% decline on the official market, on the official uh, Forex market. And then, of course, there's, there are some concerns that um, if this is going to, in terms of the equities market, is it going to have an effect on, on, on the uh, 2023 dividends for companies which have foreign liabilities? For, but we'll be talking more about the fixed income, like I said, and then the impact of that for fixed income instruments. And we have to talk more on that. Nabila Mohammed, equity uh, market analyst at Chapel Hill Denham. Thank you for joining us, Nabila. Thank you for having me. Good afternoon. Yeah, okay. Now, I, knew, I know you heard my conversation, which was on the uh, um, equities market, but this time I'm talking fixed income market. But let me start first with the Naira. Uh, it, was, it, 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 it has been down. I mean, it had hit a, a, a new record low against the dollar, both at the uh, official market and for the street market. So what impact is this having, having for the fixed income instruments? So as we have known, um, the FMDQ has sort of introduced another methodology in terms of how they compute closing rates for every day that um, they have been trading. And what that just simply means is that um, the FX uh, now sort of mirrors the trades that actually go through that particular day. And the, the, the entire uh, market, in fact, starting from the fixed income market, has actually been trading bearish since the start, uh, since we saw um, that the CBN is coming into the market to do a lot of uh, sweeps via OMO auctions and stuff. So those, ish, those things really would trickle down to the sentiments in the fixed income space. And it's just going to show that if there is no real return, in terms of investments, uh, what's the point in investing in a local currency instrument that will give you a negative real return? So really, that's just the impact that we are likely to see going forward in terms of the movement that we have seen in the FX rates. So it looks like there has been another devaluation, especially if, we, if they go by the methodology, which is currently to capture at a minimum of the five trading, uh, five la last trades um, based on this, what the circular has proposed, we we'll definitely see them capture trades that go through, whether it's within the range of 1,500, 1,400, and capturing those rates will mean that the closing rates for that day will be that move uh, when we look at it relative to when where we are coming from. So all these issues really are things that investors would likely be looking at and be looking for investments in things that bring them a positive real return. And we might likely see um, bearish sentiments, of course, prevail in the fixed income space if yields are not as attractive as investors would want to see it. Hmm. Okay, so now let's talk about the bonds side of things. As at Monday, we had um, the debt management office uh, auction, uh, carry out its uh, first auction, but we didn't talk about the outcome of that um, uh, auction, uh, particularly for the bonds market. So now, can you give us details about the bonds market as we speak for midweek trading session, uh, uh, um, the morning after the uh, uh, primary market auction by the DMO? So um, expectations around that bond auction was, were largely that rates will, you know, close, uh, will not close as high as they did. And that's largely because, number one, that particular auction they were expecting FAQ inflows. That particular auction day, uh, we, we also saw that with the FAQ inflows that hit the system, we should have sort of um, seen stop rates. When they were seeing the government being able to negotiate for lower stop rates, did not happen because they also issued OMO instruments that same day. That same day, they auctioned OMO and OMO uh, one year for that auction closed at around 17%. So that 17%, if you calculate the effective yield, it will come to around 20 21%. So if um, there is that mop up of liquidity and it now so, sort of shortens the available funds that you know investors can play with, of course they would definitely have to see that stock rates will go higher, and that is what just played out in the auction. And we are seeing that there is a bit of selling pressure, especially at the long end of, of given that there are more attractive rates at the shorter dated instrument, if OMO can give you an effective yield of 21%, you would rather be 
wanting to get returns very quickly with a one-year instrument in your portfolio rather than holding an instrument that is giving you around 16, 17, 16, 17 levels in terms of um, yield at the long later side. So you would want to see an effective yield of 21% by investing, of course, in the money market instrument. So what we are definitely going to see is investors moving away from that because that is just what the option has, has birthed has brought the movement of, of investors from the long end of the curve to the short, shorter dated instrument. And it's largely because of the attractive pricing that is starting to occur at the money in terms of the money market returns that we are starting to see. And it's all in a bid for the CBN to, of course, there is the more public liquidity, which is the tightening that the CBN has already alluded to. And, and the fact that they are trying to rein in inflation through every other possible means aside just hiking interest rates. So by doing so, they are increasing, they are making the yields on the money market instruments more attractive than on the long dated instruments. So we we'll definitely see bearish sentiments uh, prevail, uh, especially at the bond space, in the bond space going forward. Okay. Okay, Nabila, so I think we'll leave it there as far as uh, the fixed income market is concerned. And, and of course, we look out for how it ends the month of um, January, the first month for 2024. So, thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much, Biden. So That was uh, Nabila Mohamed, uh, market analyst at uh, Chapel Hill Denim on the fixed income market. Now, let's move over to the U.S. market where we see that um, today that uh, the, the, the U.S. Central Bank, what you know as the U.S. Federal Reserve, uh, you know, all eyes on, that, on the U.S. Federal Reserve, whether they will be keeping uh, their interest rates on chain, that there, there's so many expectations that they will be keeping it on chain at about 5.25%. Uh, so now, at the same time, that's going to be the start of uh, expect, expecting that um, they, they will begin the rate cut, but all eyes on that. But for, uh, for the U.S. market, we have first that the uh, that the market um, was about um, uh, the, the futures were mostly mostly negative, but at the same time, just the Dow Jones earlier earlier at uh, earlier today it was in the green, and then of course that's because the the mega the, the magnificent seven they released their their quarterly earnings which uh, the likes of Microsoft and the likes of Google, they, 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 their earnings are at, at the beat expectations. So now, uh, for, uh, in terms of the treasury yield, the 10-year treasury yield, uh, you know, it was uh, over three basis points lower at 4.024%, at, uh, while the yield on the two-year treasury was down by more than three basis points. So, but that's uh, for the U.S. market. And overnight, the three averages, what you see here, uh, they, they ended mixed, uh, you know, following the, uh, res the release of those results from the tech heavies. So we saw the S&P 500 as a Tuesday down by 0.06%. The, the Nasdaq composite pulled back by 0.76%, while the Dow Jones Industrial Average was uh, up by 0.35%, ending the Tuesday at about, uh, you know, with uh, marking its record uh, close, seventh uh, record close for the year. Now, we were about to talk about the Middle, the middle Eastern market, so let's go back to the Middle Eastern market where we see negative sentiments across board for that market. We talk about the Dubai FM, which had, had, you know, had still been maintaining some kind of green posture, but uh, at, as at intraday, it was in the red, also for its brother there, the Abu Dhabi Index, both on the UAE uh, stock exchange. So they were in the red. Let's move over to Saudi Arabia, where we see that um, it's still in the red. And that's the Arab, Arab world's uh, biggest economy, you know, which is also the biggest stock exchange there. For the Arab world, the Saudi Arabia's uh, economy, it's, um, the real GDP, it fell by 3.7% uh, year, uh, year on year. And then but that drop is uh, so about 4.4%. Uh, smaller compared to what it was in the third quarter. And this is um, attributed to uh, about a 16.4% decline in oil activities, which is the country's uh, mainstay in terms of economy. So, Ine, I would have given you more details about uh, the market, <laughs> but of course, the I time is... I think you with a whole lot of details, Anisha. Thank you for that. Pleasure. <laughs> Let's head to London now, where um, the price of meats, meat, fish, cheese, and dairy products may cost more from today. And back to the news is Brexit. Juliana, good afternoon. I, I don't think we can ever uh, be done with Brexit and the consequences. You're right, um, Inni. It's definitely going to be something that we talk about for years and years in this country, particularly today. Um, 
because um, today is a Brexit anniversary. Yes, um, it was four years ago um, that we left officially um, the European Union and um, not great celebrating your anniversary with a £300 million um, bill. And that is expected to be the cost every year uh, to small businesses in this country because of new Brexit checks that have come in today. Um, in fact, I think these checks have been delayed four times in the past because small businesses have basically said it's just unsustainable and they can't afford it. But I think, uh, you know, Brussels have been incredibly patient with the United Kingdom when it comes to delaying border checks. Uh, but this one can't be moved um, any further. So basically what it means, as you quite rightly said, fresh food, dairy products, um, meat fish, cheese, coming in to the United Kingdom from the European Union will now have to be um, physically checked. They have to have um, this health certificate um, signed off by a certified European vet or plant inspector, because this also is going to affect fresh flowers before it can come into the United Kingdom. So, of course, as you can imagine, if you're somebody um, importing uh, one of those goods, then, of course, you are going to have to spend more because you cannot import it without one of these certificates. And then, you know, the headache uh, just continues. I think, you know, it is uh, today is the anniversary, the 31st of January 2024. It was in um, 2020 on the 31st of January that we left. And I think, you know, the mood music is certainly even among the 52% of Brits that voted for Brexit, that it's just not working. It's not working uh, for anybody. Um, I think at the time, you know, we were speaking of this oven ready deal, which clearly hasn't been oven ready. We're still working on um, the Brexit protocol, which is the issue with Northern Ireland. Um, we were promised that there was going to be this UK-USA uh, trade deal. That is absolutely nowhere in sight. And Joe Biden, the US president, has confirmed that. Then early this week, Kemi Badenoch, British Nigerian UK trade secretary, um, she froze a deal with Canada. So in, in terms of trading at the moment across the world, all of the, the benefits of Brexit, you know, are not manifesting. Um, and then again, you know, on the, the day of the four year anniversary, uh, taxpayers British businesses are going to get a £300 uh, million pound deal. Not going great. And as to be expected, as PMQs is going on in the Palace of Westminster as I speak, it's certainly a to topic um, among um, both sides of the House. Mm. I just wonder what the permanent solution would be. Uh, there plans of going back but I mean that's a bigger picture but it's not also a very good picture um, in north of England uh, rail service uh, strike back again yeah, that's absolutely right. You know, it's another day, another sector in the UK is out on strike. This time it is train drivers who are being represented by the Aslev Union. So this is affecting um, commuters who would have come in uh, from the north of Eng England. So it's the Northern Express and the Trans Pennine Express. In fact, this is the second 24-hour industrial action in just seven days. I think last week, so the surveys were saying that tens of thousands of people just couldn't get into work into um, here in the capital uh, because the trains weren't working. And again, it's, you know, we're kind of locked into a system here of discontent. Um, lots of workers across sectors are not happy and they're not able uh, to reach a, a settlement with the British government. Now, in terms of the British government's position, um, last year, quite controversially, they put in this new law of minimum service levels, which all employers in the UK have to adhere to. Um, and what that basically means is even if 90% of your staff go on strike, you have to have a system in place uh, where your business can still continue. That's not happening on the train lines. Again, that was a controversial piece of legislation. So I'm not sure how bosses feel really um, about, you know, telling somebody legally you can't go on strike. Um, so, yeah, that's a massive issue, again, for people that are commuting into the British capital. They've not been able to get in today. It's 24 hours. So even when um, the strike is lifted at about 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, you are still going to get hours of delays because, of course, they're not going to start until 7 a.m. Uh, so more headache for the prime minister. Yeah, more headache for the PM right there. Let's head to the markets. How's that looking? 
more headaches on the markets. Um, it is not flying quite as high as it is in Nigeria. The all share is down 0.09% at intraday. The FTSE 100 down by 0.08%. FTSE 250, the domestic market, Italy, that's down by 0.14%. In the currencies market, the British pound is trading down against the US dollar too by 0.15%, also down against the euro by 0.03%. But there is one up, and that's against the Japanese yen by 0.10% uh, in A. All right, Juliana, thank you so much uh, for that update from the UK. And uh, talking about the uh, Europe, well, where they used to be, where the UK used to be, let's head to uh, Europe now. And Germany has uh, uh, for long been seen as the engine of Europe's economy. But as of late, the country has become the sick man of the European continent. Uh, why? Well, Lars Holter is right there, so who best to tell us to, uh, what's going on, why Germany is now considered sick. Hi Lars, good afternoon, what's going on? Thanks for having me, Ini. Well, among the countries most affected by the economic weakness in Germany are our Eastern European neighbors, Hungary, the Czech Republic, and Slovakia. And that is because over the past few decades, they have built up a large auto supply sector that sold heavily to Germany's once mighty car sector. And that was great business for a while, as long as Germany was a leading nation on the world's auto market. But now, as that sector has shifted and car makers from outside Germany, including Tesla, of course, but also France and even China have taken over market share and uh, cut into sales for brands like Volkswagen, BMW or Mercedes-Benz. Now those ties have become a drag on their economies. The problem, of course, is those countries, Hungary or the Czech Republic and Slovakia, they're already suffering from other economic problems. Last year, inflation in Hungary stood at 25 percent and interest rates have been jacked up. In uh, the the Czech Republic, wages have been down for eight consecutive quarters. Uh, so weakness in Germany affecting those countries just adds to their problems. Yeah, so uh, does it look like there's a way out? Well, uh, some companies there that have been extremely reliant on ties with Germany are trying to tap deeper into other overseas market. Uh, some are also trying to branch out into industries like defense. However, that hasn't been easy given that we are seeing multiple geopolitical crises uh, with the Ukraine war, the Middle East conflict. It's hard right now to forge new relationships, but they're trying. I've heard from one gentleman, a top level manager at Hungary's uh, Alap Group. They provide management services for car and aerospace clients. They're apparently trying to make up for a decline in Western European markets by ramping up orders from Asian clients. Meanwhile, uh, the Czech Exporters Association says that they're looking for new markets within Europe, but that a shortfall like they're seeing now with Germany uh, that they cannot just uh, replace within half a year that easily. Uh, a long story short, companies in the Eastern European market are working their way out of too much of a dependency on Germany, but they're in for a bumpy ride. What about the investors? What are they focusing today? Yeah, new day, same old question. What's the Fed going to do? Their two-day meeting is ending in Washington today and everyone is expecting, of course, interest rates to uh, remain unchanged. I guess investors are just waiting for the Fed statement that comes with their policy decision. Will that give us an indication of what's really coming next? An interest rate cut next month or much more likely, I guess, in summer, what is the level of confidence the Fed officials are showing in the strength of the U.S. economy? What are they saying about inflationary pressures? All that is what investors are being focused on today. Yeah, well, interest rates cuts or hold uh, to possibilities. Thank you so much, Lars, for that. Let's uh, come back to the African continent now. The International Monetary Fund, as the IMF, has revised its economic growth projection for South Africa projected downward, citing logistical challenges that are impeding activity and negatively affecting the broader region, uh, Africa's most industrialized economy, is anticipated to experience a modest growth of 1% this year. Our correspondent in South Africa, Innocent Samosa, put together this report on the expectations.
The International Monetary Fund expresses concern regarding South Africa's precarious fiscal position and high levels of public debt. Our forecast for South Africa starts with what happened in 2023, a very low growth year in the context of uh, power disruptions. 0.6% is our uh, estimation of what growth was in 2023. But then in 2024, we see a gradual increase towards 1%. Uh, that is a, a lower number than we uh, had in October uh, by 0.8 down. And the main reason for the uh, downgrade there is that there are some additional disruptions in the logistical sectors, rail, ports, and that combined with the continuing uh, challenges still with the uh, electricity produ uh, production. The IMF sees sub-Saharan Africa growing by 3.8% this year. However, external shocks continues to pose a challenge. Uh, one of the things about the sub-Saharan uh, uh, African region is it's very exposed to external uh, shocks. And we've had a number of uh, adverse external shocks in the last few years. The Russian uh, invasion of Ukraine and the associated energy crisis, the surge in food prices, the tightening of uh, uh, policy rates in uh, major central banks around the world that has increased interest rates and therefore increased uh, uh, funding costs. Could you kindly please talk to us about Nigeria? Nigeria's GDP growth projection, and also I would like to inquire about your assessment of the banking sector, um, external debt, any recommendation for sustainable economic development in Nigeria. But also still on that in that region, speaking about ECOWAS, there are some countries that are threatening to leave. How much of a blow will that um, have on trade? Because there are some people who are using um, ECOWAS passports for trade and investment. Thank you. Uh, so on, on Nigeria's growth rate, we have, as has been pointed out, uh, a slight downward revision for 24 uh, this year, uh, 3%, it's a negative 0 0.1 percentage point. Uh, next year is unchanged at 3.1%. Uh, um, and on uh, the impact of uh, uh, you know Mali and uh, uh, Niger and Burkina Faso leaving ECOWAS that was announced, uh, yesterday, this is something that, of course, we're, we're monitoring, we, we're taking note, it's, it's a bit early to, uh, to assess. The International Monetary Fund says that geopolitical tensions remains a threat uh, for trade and investment. They say that expansion remains slow, but also they're advocating for steady fiscal consolidation. From Johannesburg, South Africa, Innocent Samosa, Channels Television News. We head to Zimbabwe where now foreigners applying for Zimbabwean citizenship on the basis of permanent residence will be required to pay 5,000 US dollars cash for both adults and minors, while those who seek restoration of citizenship after renouncing it will be required to pay $1,000. Home Affairs and Cultural Heritage Minister Kazambe Kazambe uh, gazetted new fees for obtaining various identity documents issued by department under his ministry. The new fees are stipulated in statutory instruments published in an extraordinary government gazette yesterday and they are pegged in US dollars or equivalent at the prevailing interbank rate. Issuance of initial birth certificate for persons six years or younger remains free of charge while those above six, it should be five dollars with an initial death certificate pegged at two dollars. Talk about debts now. Kenyan President William Ruto has dismissed any claims that Kenya is at risk of defaulting on its Eurobond commitment, which is due in June this year, 2024. Speaking on the sidelines of the Italy Africa Summit in Rome, Mr. Ruto said that his advisers were right to stall the planned Eurobond buyback in December 2023. In November 2023, Ruto informed the parliament that Kenya intended to repurchase $300 million, that's about 48.24 billion shillings, of the $2 billion, uh, that's about 321.6 billion shillings, Eurobond, by the end of 2023. But he later stated that the government's advisers ultimately advised against proceeding 
with the buyback. And still talking about debts, uh, we head to Libya, where the president, Joseph Yuma Boakai, says that Liber Liberia's current public debt stock stands at 2.21 billion, and the stock of public debt at the end of December 2023 stood at $2.21 billion, and that's an increase of 8.6% compared to the end of December 2022 uh, the stock was at 2.08 billion shilling, uh, dollars, I beg your pardon. They said that this represents a sharp increase of $1.33 billion compared to the end of December. In June last year, Libya's central bank in Tripoli failed to account for the delivery of $4.8 billion worth of local Dina bank notes from a British printing company, according to a leaked financial review, raising questions about where the money went. Let's head to the crypto space now. All right, before that, uh, Ladi, just one minute, where the African Development Bank, AFDB, wants Kenya and Tanzania to speed up the signing of three key agreements to pave way for exchange of excess electricity between the two countries. And uh, the three are uh, wheeling agreement between Tanzania Electric, Electric Supply Company and Kenya Electricity Transmission Company, and a power exchange deal between Kenya Power and Tanesco, a tripartite deal for the maintenance of the interconnected grid. We need electricity for even crypto to function. So, Ladi. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, when we see the AFDB intervening, you know, helping African countries, because we know infrastructure, top on that list, yep. electricity is a major challenge, major for, challenge right yeah, for businesses in uh, on the continent. So, I so mean. You say you want to produce, you, you need power. You, you need know, power. That, so even when you don't produce, produce, even if you just wanted to rest at home, right. you would need power. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To rest and to produce. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the markets now, uh, the crypto market. Uh, see, it's, uh, it's red, it's red, it's red. We've been seeing this trend uh, for some days now. It's profit taking still uh, being carried out in this market. Bitcoin in red, Ethereum, BNB, XRP. The whole market at this point, just few pockets um, of green. Let's look at the top stories. Um, now, top headlines uh, in the crypto space there. We're seeing a top metric now showing that uh, there is some possibility that uh, stable coins uh, are enough uh, to get most of the Bitcoin. The key stable coin metric, um, that's dropped about 80%. Um, percent. see data from on-chain analytics firm Glassnode um, showing an ongoing drop in the stable coin supply ratio. That's SSR um, oscillator. The SSR oscillator tracks the ratio between uh, Bitcoin market cap and the combined value of all, all known um, stable coins. We know how investors like their stable coins in the crypto market. When there's so much volatility, they run into that, you know, for safety. So this is a plus, you know, showing that um, the stable coin uh, metric uh, can, most of these stable coins can actually, you know, purchase most, most of the Bitcoin there. So that's a, a bullish sentiment for Bitcoin. And uh, Vitalik there, as the creator of Ethereum, is warning about adding AI to blockchain. His um, because right now, everyone's talking about AI and all the great things AI can do. But he's saying, you know what, hold your horses, be careful how you add artificial intelligence to blockchain because it also poses a lot of risk. That's according to uh, Vitalik uh, Buterin. Uh, let's, uh, well, it's, it's inflation and um, all about rates uh, this period. Also, yeah, we see Thailand, is, uh, SEC has revamped um, crypto um, rules you know, in their country. It's all about, you know, getting regulation for crypto at this point. I've seen the Thailand's uh, Securities and Exchange Commission, uh, they've introduced a revised regulatory framework marking a significant shift towards supporting the digital asset market. So uh, this is going to help um, investors in Thailand uh, know how to, you know, differentiate what to, how to invest, you know, in the crypto market so that they, they play um, with the rules. So let's bring in Gilbert Jokpata. Is, uh, FOMC day right there. All eyes on the U.S. Fed. What are they going to do with rates? Is it going to be a hold as expected or are they going to raise rates? Let's talk to Gilbert Jopata now, financial market analyst. Uh, great to have you, Gilbert. Yeah, nice to be here, Mr. Ladi. Fantastic. So 98%, uh, we have consensus here. 98% say the U.S. Fed is going to hold rates uh, today. Definitely, I'm sure that's already priced into the market, but we're seeing a lot of red in the crypto market. What are you seeing? 
Oh, it's first day, and uh, once upon a time, this used to be uh, a big event, capable of some major market volatility. Uh, I'm not underplaying this event. I, I, I know it remains significant, but uh, I'm expecting no change on the table, except Powell chooses to uh, surprise us. Uh, but so far, you know, smart investors have already pushed even the expectation of a rate cut from March to May. And uh, this, this expectation has uh, came in more after the CPA data that came out last week Friday that shows uh, inflation remains moderate while consumer spending remain uh, strong. And uh, but, but I still know we need to pay attention to some clues from uh, the press conference today to know if uh, we may deviate from our current uh, data. But when you look at what is happening in, in the market away from uh, macroeconomics because I, I believe that as much as macroeconomics still have uh, an effect on the next direction of the market, uh, it's not it's no longer as volatile as it should be. Uh, Bitcoin right now is forming uh, more of a... Bitcoin is experiencing a dissipation period. It rebounds and already forming more of a legacy head and shoulder bottom. So we are testing that bottom uh, well. You know, this is actually a triggering event because uh, I, I believe this is a period where we'll have more investors rush into the market. So Bitcoin is about testing its uh, legacy head and shoulder bottom, which gets to about 41,000 and even 40,000. But then uh, this is a very, very major support that will lead us to uh, a stage where investors will rush into the market, both retail investors and institutional investors. Right. Well, we'll definitely be looking out uh, for decision. Uh, that'll be, uh, we'll, we'll be following the, the details and what is going to be saying, you know, going forward, forward guidance at the end of the day. That's what every investor is going to be listening out for. Thank you so much, uh, Gilbert Jopata, financial market analyst. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so, yeah, any, it's, it's uh, rates uh, season again, and uh, definitely February next month we'll be getting uh, the first one for, from the MPC oh, yeah. uh, right here in Nigeria, even though That's we're all looking out. That's the more important decision. Well, yeah, <laughs> depends on where you're investing from at this point. <laughs> All right, laddie, thank you so thank much. You. Yeah, so that's it on the program. Thank you so much for being a part of this 55 minutes, uh, taking you around the world from the market to the macroeconomics to crypto and all of that. Let's do it again tomorrow. And uh, do remember, stock market report. We'll find out how the NGX is holding up. Is it going to sustain that recovery today? Find out at 10 p.m. with Laddie Williams. I'm Ini John Mekwa. Oh, have a enjoy the rest of the day.